Welcome, comrades, to the Spectre of Communism podcast. Today's episode is going to be a bit of a change of pace. I'm sure that there are plenty of history buffs that listen to the show, and you might be aware that Ridley Scott of Alien fame has released a grand historical biopic of Napoleon Bonaparte. Now, both myself and my guest, uh, Keelan Kelliger, who is a leading member of Socialist Appeal, soon to be the Revolutionary Communist Party, the British section of the IMT, uh, we both have some thoughts about this film, I think it's fair to say, Keelan, right? That's right, yeah, definitely. Um, now, this isn't a film review podcast. <laughs> we are going to be talking about the events of the film a little bit, so I guess you can call this a spoiler warning. But really, I think it's an opportunity to talk more about the history, about the politics, about the figure of Napoleon Bonaparte, who Marx and Engels both wrote about extensively. They named an important theory after Napoleon Bonaparte. We'll get into that later. But let's start with the film, um, Keelan, because I know that you're writing a review mm -hmm. for Socialist Appeal. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So uh, what did you think? Well, it was awful. <laughs> it was absolutely awful. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> how, how many stars were we saying? I'd say, I'd say two. And I'd say two is for probably the Battle of Austerlitz. Um, which, which was still pretty historically inaccurate. Which is terribly historically inaccurate, but at least it was entertaining and very, like, it had some cinematic you know cinematographic value i guess right um but i'd say yeah um that was one of the few redeeming features of a, a generally very turgid film yeah i i also wasn't a great fan of the movie um i want to hear more about your thoughts on it but a thing that struck me is that there were so many potentially really exciting things mm. and just from a narrative point of view they could have depicted you know, they reduced the Battle of the Pyramids, mm -hmm. which is one mm -hmm. of the most fascinating battles and one of the most dramatic battles in Napoleon's career. You know, 20,000 or 12,000 Mamelukes killed mm -hmm. to only 200 French. It was mm -hmm. a crushing victory. Um, and they literally have one scene of him shooting the Sphinx, which never actually, the pyramid, sorry, mm -hmm. they have one scene of him shooting the pyramids, mm -hmm. which didn't actually happen. A Mameluke <laughs> falls off his horse and that's the end of it. <laughs> Uh, all sorts of historical inaccuracies, of course. You know, Napoleon never actually attended the execution of Marie, of Marie Antoinette. Mm. He was already at the siege of Toulon at mm -hmm, that point. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's it's not true that he left Egypt because he found out Josephine was having an affair. Mm -hmm. You know, plenty of things throughout the movie. One thing that really annoyed me, actually, and this is a bit of a, I don't know, historical um, nerd <laughs> irritation, perhaps. But remember in, when they depict Waterloo mm. and... Um, Wellington uses infantry squares to repel mm -hmm, the cavalry mm -hmm. and it's the big dramatic moment that shows Napoleon's been beaten mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. it makes it very much look like that was Wellington's innovation mm -hmm, and he pulled mm -hmm. it out of the bag but A, in infantry squares have been around for ages mm. and B, Napoleon had innovated a, a, a really effective use of the infantry square mm -hmm. at the Battle of the Pyramids <laughs> to defeat the Mameluk yeah. cavalry which was basically used against him mm, later, mm. and none of that is shown. It mm -hmm. felt like such a missed mm. opportunity. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and look, I think this, you know, it would be fine if the main problem with this film was its historical inaccuracies in a certain sense, because I think, you know, I don't think anyone expected to go in there for it to be this extremely um, historically um, accurate presentation of events, right? That might have been too dry or too difficult a task to pull off, but I think... I think he just went way too far with it, and uh, and it kind of, as, as a result, kind of felt like it had no real narrative um, at all, right? When actually the real narrative of this whole period is extremely fascinating and extremely interesting. Yeah, and the point is, it was clear that Scott just wasn't very interested in the politics. No. I mean, you, you've breezed through the French Revolution and Council Revolution, mm. and yet the entire first two thirds of the movie are just these interminable cringy bedroom <laughs> scenes mm, between mm. Napoleon and Josephine mm. um, and Napoleon himself is portrayed basically as a deeply insecure, mm. quite pathetic um, little corporal yeah. I suppose and actually my theory, I don't know what you think about this mm. is that the, 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 the director and the screenwriter uh, base their depiction of Napoleon on bawdy Napoleonic war propaganda mm. from the British side mm. because that's very much the way the, that Napoleon was portrayed by the British mm. during during his wars as this cuckolded um, Corsican upstart mm. this little brute and that figure is 
essentially the way that Napoleon's depicted in the movie. I don't mm. think it's unjust when people are pointed out to Scott that it feels like a very pro-British, very anti-French film. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, to which I think his response was, well, the French all hate themselves. Um, you know, like, which I presume, it, you know, is there's, a, there's an element of that as well. There's a contempt for... Um, for like the, the 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 masses when they whenever they feature um, as well right particularly the French obviously the French masses because the two times they feature is for the execution of Marie Antoinette and, and I think of Robespierre and it's like this kind of um, like I, I don't know like nineteen thirties or, or or forties French music overlaid like the the the, the crowds uh, kind of. Um, cheering on the the execution, just like out of a kind of out of a bloodlust, basically, and that's yes. the that's the French masses for yeah. you. They're obeying mob. I mean, that <laughs> yeah, reminds yeah. me very much of the counter-revolutionary reactionary propaganda that followed the French mm, Revolution, that mm. portrayed the French masses as just this bloodthirsty mob, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, with with no real agency or mm, will mm, or mm. ambitions or aspirations of their own, mm, just mm. a bunch of angry paupers eager to see some rich people taken mm. down a few pegs. Mm. Um, but anyway, as I said, this isn't uh, this isn't a <laughs> film review podcast. Uh, this is uh, this is a political podcast, mm. and our main uh, contention with the film is that it portrayed the history of the era in a very distorted way, mm. and it leaves out lots of really important mm-hmm, mm-hmm. details and events from our point of view. So let's get into those. Mm. Um, the French Revolution and Counter Revolution in in the film is dealt with in the space of I think about twenty minutes, um, spread out over twenty minutes, mm. maybe two or three scenes altogether. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. you have execution of Marie Antoinette, Robespierre shoots himself. Um, there's there's the coup, and then Napoleon declares himself emperor, and that's mm. basically all that you see. Um, and it's an, a missed opportunity because it's. Uh, one of the most dramatic, fascinating, mm. inspiring, and a tragic series of events in history. So I know that you recently gave a very good lead-off at the Revolution Festival. I'll put a report in the description of this episode in Britain uh, where you talked about the French Revolution. Mm. So can you give us a little bit of a an executive summary mm-hmm. of these events? What was the stuff that the mm. film left out as far as the French Revolution and Napoleon's counter-revolution go. Mm. Mm. Well, I mean, you know, what what strikes you first when you kind of really start looking into the French Revolution is just how how the kind of, the whole feudal ed- edifice that, that was kind of, that, that was still there, how much that was rotting on its feet, mm. um, basically, in a, in a kind of real sense of um, of just decay, all about different aspects of society. And uh, obviously, that's very comparable to the kind of era we're living in today, right? You ask most people, people feel like society is going backwards. I think that is very analogous to how people would have felt in 18th century France as well. Just rather than it being feudalism that's dying on its feet, it's obviously capitalism today. But yeah, I mean, that's one of the things that strikes you. But then obviously, what what is even more, I think, striking is how obviously this, you know, as I was as I was saying, that was the, the decay of feudalism. What what that the objective process that was taking place was a bourgeois revolution. But in reality, the victory that the bourgeois um, gained for themselves in France, they owed to to the masses, basically the the, the sans culotte masses, who were every every turn decisively intervened to save the revolution. Whether that's Bastille, um, after the kind of events of, uh, of of sort of you know the tennis court oath and so on, and um, the kind of yeah the third estate, which the, you know the bourgeois in this in this kind of feudal assembly, um, declaring themselves as the national assembly and so on. That in reality, that is. That is pushed through because of the intervention of the masses. You see the same again in in uh, in October, um, when the the, the women of, uh, of 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 Paris come and drag uh, the king to from Versailles to to, to the Tuileries. Yeah, right? they go literally knock on his door and demand <laughs> to see him and drag him outside. Don't yeah, they? exactly, exactly. Like give us bread and and get yourself back here, you know. And uh, that's really inspiring um, stuff. And but it's so indicative of just how at every turn. Like the bourgeois just loses confidence in its in its own revolution, draws back from it in effect, uh, because it's inspired the like it's inspired all this mass resentment and anger against all of the injustices of uh, of of um, French society, and they're terrified by that because they're very well aware that uh, you know a strike against feudal property can very quickly turn to a strike against their property, mm-hmm. and that's another interesting dynamic of the of the revolution is that actually in order to as as things developed, in order to save the the revolution, you actually do begin to see um, that the, the revolution take in inro- make, make inroads against bourgeois property, basically, mm. uh, and particularly you know with the the maximum uh, on prices and so on. 
Um, you know that's obviously an attack against against kind of the the, the, the free free competition and the the ability for the for you know producers to set their own prices and so on. Uh, they make inroads as well with regards to the state. Basically, at one point, I think this is seventeen ninety um, three, where the kind of you know after the execution of the of the king and so on and uh, the, the wars escalating to a, to a great extent britain and spain are involved and so on like the, and, and they're surrounded on all sides there's counter revolutionary insurrections in in major cities like uh, like like toulon well this is the point mm. this isn't really given much attention in the film no, but, you wouldn't but, know. But, but there was a there was a a monarchist counter-revolution mm. that seized Toulon with the assistance mm. of the British, mm-hmm. who mm-hmm. were effectively supporting a uh, monarchist counter-revolution from without. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And in that, faced with that kind of a, of a situation, the the French state began to actually organise uh, war production. Right, you had an, you had kind of the state scouring the 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 kind of the country for for I think it's called saltpeter, the stuff to make gunpowder. And they and because before that period, France had always imported it. Then mm. it, it had you know it had to kind of turn that around in the in the face where it was obviously surrounded by all these hostile countries, unable to do that anymore. And to yeah to to and it was able to cultivate a domestic industry for that. It produced um, a major armaments factory that was t- like turning out seven hundred guns a, a a week or something like this. And that's absolutely remarkable for the period, right? Like, mm. uh, and obviously shows you just how far. Like that was obviously not the vision of the bourgeois at all, right? No. Um. Of and and so on. And yet, and yet, that was to defend the bourgeois revolution. Yes. And so it's like a, there, there's that always that contradiction driving through it throughout. That actually, it's the it's the masses that play the most decisive role in a revolution that's not fundamentally in their interests, and that brings the kind of that brings about the tragedy that I think you were referring to at the start as well. Yes. Um. And. Let's talk about that tragedy, about mm. the counter revolution. Actually, before we do that, let's talk mm. about Robespierre mm-hmm, mm-hmm. because the poor guy gets two scenes. <laughs> yes. uh, <laughs> one of them, he's defending the terror mm. and making not unjust points, actually. No. That speech, no. I think, is a reasonably accurate reflection yeah, of yeah, yeah. Robespierre's argument. Basically, he's saying, well, look, this is a terror against the, the Bourbon dynasty, mm. against the, um, the feudal aristocrats mm. who've been inflicting poverty Mm. and misery and arbitrary detention Mm. and despotism on the poor for years and years Mm. and years Mm. and this is just revenge and this is defense Mm. of the new order Mm. which is based on on reason and fraternity and liberty and equality and so on Mm. of course for all the reasons you said Mm. there are contradictions in the french revolution And then the second scene, he shoots himself and um, <laughs> fails to kill himself. Yeah. And they, aren't, they don't even show his execution. Mm. They don't even give him the dignity of showing his mm. execution. Mm. But um, what can we say of, of Maximilien Robespierre mm. and the Jacobins? Yeah, I mean, obviously I played like an absolutely outstanding role in the revolution and was, was amongst the kind of most... Um, determined of the, of of the bourgeois revolutionaries in effect right he was the most determined like he was there right from the beginning and as part of the third estate um kind of yeah as as its most advanced wing but he de- he, he undergoes a political development way you know he realizes that like for the bourgeois revolution to succeed, it's, there's no compromise to be had with the king, um, and that yeah, like this has to this has to go all the way, right? We ha- this revolution has to be completed, and he represented that most decisive there as a result. The Jacobins as well, you know, that was they un- they underwent um, a kind of whole series of transformations, um, and again represented that kind of um, the most forthright. Um, bourgeois revolutionary. So, kind of... in case anyone's not clear, by the way, we're talking about the, ja- the Jacobin Club, which yes, was basically yeah. a political party yeah, yeah, yeah. that became the leadership of the French Revolution. Yeah, yeah. Uh, its most decisive wing, definitely. Um, and its leader was Maximilien Robespierre, mm. who is depicted briefly mm, uh, mm. in the film. Yeah, no, ex- yeah, exactly. And uh, you know, at one point, this the, the Jacobin Club was was you had about a million members, right? Mm. And this you're talking about late 18th century France, it's remarkable. Yeah. I mean, at the height of the Corbyn movement, that was, what, half a million people yeah. involved in the Labour Party, right? Uh, maybe it's a bit more, but the, uh, yeah, you can see kind of the, the mass participation in this. And um, But yeah, this this club underwent a series of, of, of basically uh, a kind of process of radicalisation as the, as the revolution went on. Um, and it started off actually as, as a kind of a, a kind of purely bourgeois um, kind of institution, if you like, Um you know, with where you had, you know, it was kind of meeting as, as in the in salons and so on, and contained all sorts of of, of very respectable gentlemen. Mm. Um, but as the revolution went on, they, they, those those respectable gentlemen could kind of abandoned it um, as they kind of drew back from the, the the fact that it was drawing in the masses as well, right? Because in the slogan, liberty, uh, equality, fraternity, right? 
the the French bourgeois had one understanding, but the sans culotte masses had a very different one, yeah. and that inspired their their participation. Right? They 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 saw it as not just an equality of rights, but an equality of means. Right? And but sans culottes it mm. means without trousers, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Can you quickly explain who we mean by the sans culottes? Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Because I think this is this is a really inter- interesting part of it, right? Because it's not quite a proletariat. Yeah, uh, as we understand it There's today. There's no working class as such as we no, know it today. Exactly, exactly. We're talking about the urban poor. Um, right, so, so so the Jacobin Club is radicalised by events. Mm, it's got the mm. pressure of the urban poor behind it. Mm-hmm, the peasantry mm. as well play a role. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, they're, they're looting the landed estates, mm, mm. launching big riots against the landowners in the countryside. So there's a, there's a wide social base of the French Revolution. The Jacobins are at the epicentre. Robespierre uh, is the most determined leader of the French Revolution. What are the circumstances that lead to him being deposed? The the process of the revolution is one of just like a constant kind of um, splits within the within the bourgeois. Basically, is more and more layers go go over to counter revolution. In effect, despite the fact that this is objectively a bourgeois revolution, more and more layers of the bourgeois as things progress, as more more radical measures have to be taken to defend that revolution. Things that I was talking about before about impositions on bourgeois property, for instance. Things, but of course, things like the terror as well, right? Um, which is in in effect what that was 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 it was an extreme measure um, to to defend a, a revolution which was under under siege right mm. and not just within France you know you mentioned uh, that the kind of the up, the uprisings obviously the Vendée as well it was an immense a, a massive uh, uprising counter revolutionary uprising know, but not just that obviously being invaded by by pretty much all the major powers of Europe right um, and it's some analogies with the Russian Revolution absolutely actually. absolutely because the reason for the same reason that uh, the bourgeois sent 21 foreign armies of intervention against um, against the Bolsheviks was the same reason that inspired the kings of Europe to, to try and crush the French Revolution. Right? It, was a, it, was a, it was a terrifying example. Well, the Bolsheviks were even described as Jacobins. Yes, yeah, uh, yeah. So e- even by that point, the shadow of the French Revolution mm. was spooking the yeah, elites yeah, yeah. and the, the rich of, of Europe. Definitely, definitely, exactly. And and it's because they, 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 they represented the most determined layers of the revolution, which is mm. you could exactly say the same for the for the Bolsheviks, right? Like, there's, mm. there's no... Uh, room for vacillation there, in, in mm. effect. And then, but once the threat of counter-revolution begins to kind of abate, right? As as the as the revolution crushes, uh, you know, wins wins decisive victories over the Vendée, defeats the British and recaptures Toulon, for instance, defeats the Prussians uh, and, and the Austrians in in various battles. That once that starts to happen, the threat of counter-revolution is lifted from uh, from over the kind of situation, even even if temporarily. That suddenly, suddenly, the, the, this this contradiction of the bourgeois revolution that's made in roads and bourgeois property comes to the surface, and Robespierre, who n- never want like he 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 didn't make any of these inroads into bourgeois property out of ideology or principle. He he always saw it as a necessary evil, like he saw the suspension of of uh, you know democratic uh, liberties as, as a necessary evil, right? Because the Jacobin Constitution was the most democratic constitution that the revolution produced. It was just never implemented because of the conditions of you know being under siege and all the rest of it and he saw the, the inroads on bourgeois property in the same manner right as as suspension of that constitution and uh, so once that threat was lifted he begins very quickly not to see the, the biggest danger coming from the right but from the left from from the plebeian masses that he's rested on all the way through he sees them as the biggest threat and he strikes out at them in in i think march 1794 with the the arrest of uh, of a guy called Ebert, who was kind of the the, the lead, the, the kind of one of the leading figures of the Enra, and has him executed along with a series of other kind of left radical um, uh, Jacobins, whether they, yeah, o- o- overwhelmingly outside of the uh, assembly um, of the convention rather, and that very much represents his the beginning of his of his downfall, because that is the layer he's been resting upon the mm. whole. Time. He has no real base of support because the bourgeois have long since abandoned him. They see him as this like um, this 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 madman that's gone too far. Basically, yeah. uh, they huge layers of the bourgeois f- for a long time have sought uh, basically to effect a compromise with yeah. with reaction. So his role was played as far as they're concerned. Exactly at that moment, the bourgeois is desperate for a, re- a kind of return to normality, basically, yeah. and end to this an end to this kind of uh, the, the, the the involvement of the masses in effect, mm. who are kind of running the situation. How do we build communism? Issue forty three of In Defense of Marxism, the IMT's theoretical magazine, is out now. Link in the description, and it aims to answer this question. There's a piece on the trials tribulations of building the planned economy in the Soviet Republic, an article on the revolution in Soviet theatre, and another on the tragic lessons of the working class's defeat in Germany in 1923. Pick up your issue today.
How does our friend Napoleon come into the picture? But yeah, Nap- Napoleon actually aligned himself initially with the Robespierre's because um, you know the, the the two brothers, and uh, you know I think very quickly kind of tried to distance himself from that after after his downfall. Um, but yeah, the the way he was able to to kind of gain get gain his position i think was was basically by being the kind of that that desperate that desperate desire for order to mm. be maintained he it was he was able to embody that in in effect right like he was able you know it was him that had delivered uh, the the kind of salvation in in the situation in 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 Toulon he would go on to then um align himself with with a with a, a guy called Barras um who was portrayed in the film as well i think yes um and he that the two were kind of uh, in, in in effect tr- sort of trying to to bring the the kind of they were trying to bring the revolution to a halt, not but not necessarily reverse it. Right, that was the kind of situation uh, that they found themselves in, and Napoleon provided uh, the kind of um, the perfect expedient for that. He was he became the kind of having kind of yeah, as you you kind of described the sword of the of the revolution, crushing the counter revolution and so on. Um, it was it was became very quickly obvious that he was happy to use that sword. Against anyone. In a well, film. I mean, they, they do show in the film at one point him turning the grape shot mm. on the... They show a crowd. Yeah. They allude to the fact that it's a pro-monarchy mm. crowd. Mm. But this is basically the popular base of the counter-revolution. Yeah. And Napoleon really did shoot them down in the yeah, streets. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, like, had no had no qualms. Um, which is why... And that I think that's... Th- th- there's an interesting point here, isn't there, about kind of... Um, the role of the individual, I think, mm. um, in the, in that someone as kind of as, as ruthless as he was was perfect for that situation. Yes, had he had had someone with more scruples kind of held back a bit, who who knows what the outcome of that monarchist demonstration might have been? Um, it could it could have had the, the the effect of toppling what was a very vulnerable like the directory was a was was a rotten regime, right? Mm. It, it was like and the directory was the the, the coup regime that followed exa- the fall of Robespierre. Exactly, exactly. Um, who basically represented a kind of a, a bourgeois republic with a bourgeois that wanted a return of the monarchy. Yeah. Um, and which is you know very similar to the situation France finds itself in again in the eighteen forty eight revolutions, right? You see mm-hmm. that that parallel. Um, precisely because in 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 a monarch they see that the 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 chance to restore order basically yes. it's it's uh, it, it's not so much about this or that political principle it's the yearning for an end to the intervention of the masses that and they make some allusion to this in the film mm. but was Napoleon broadly popular amongst the people I'd say I think he I think he became became so. Um, Particularly, particularly amongst well, what people in effect? Right. Uh, I think is the is the important question, and I think the main stratum of society that he ended up resting upon were, were the peasantry. Right. Um, and this is an and this is something I didn't talk about before. This is another aspect of of, of Robespierre's downfall as well, mm. in that for the by seventeen ninety three, everything a peasant could want, if you like, from the revolution, everything they could get out of it, has been got in that sense. Right. They've, they've, there's been that redistribution of land. And that's important because it it does then mean that for the for the French peasantry they also have a bit of a kind of okay now I just want to get on with, and that's the overwhelming majority of the French yes, population. Yeah. We're talking about eighty odd percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe even more. Exactly, exactly. Um, and so that is a decisive social social weight. Mm. Um, obviously, in a certain sense, because it because of the nature of the peasantry, it it can't. It's never able to to intervene and, and kind of. Uh, determine events in, in its necessarily in its own interest, right? It can swing behind this or that class, mm. this or that figure, um, which is what you see with, with with the rise of Napoleon. But what, what Napoleon embodies for the the French peasant is the man that secures them the the fruits of that revolution, mm. right? Whilst at the same time bringing an end to all that disquiet, all of that uh, um, kind of chaos, which yeah. is preventing them from enjoying that victory. All of these weird city folk having their strange arguments exactly. a long way away. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's an end to all of that. <laughs> exactly. Um, and, and also, importantly, a base amongst the army. Yes. And that, yeah. of course, is also decisive, and it's very important Absolutely. in relation to the phenomenon of Bonapartism, mm, which we'll deal mm. with a bit later on. Can but... you also give a bit of a summary of the events leading up to what we call Brumaire? I mean, mm. this is a term that Marx uses... Um, it might be a bit obscure to listeners, but all it means is the month that the coup through which Napoleon sees his power took place in, mm-hmm. because after the revolution, they renamed all the months um, rather than being named after gods or mythological figures or what have you. They renamed them after natural processes. It was mm-hmm. part of their 
um, Enlightenment principles. Mm-hmm. So you had you had Thermidor, which was the month that the coup against Robespierre took mm-hmm. place in. You had Floreal, like flowers, and you had Fructidor, like fruit. Uh, mm-hmm. Brumaire was um, the the month in which the coup that led to Napoleon seizing power took mm-hmm. place in. So can we give a bit of a run up mm-hmm. to those events and also describe those events? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, well, as I was saying, like the the Directory is this rotten regime, right? The, the the as you said, the regime that was established by the the Thermidorian coup. And as a, as a consequence, it was never able to actually get hold of the situation. Yeah. Uh, it's constantly beset by, um, a, like, basically insurrections from, from the left and from the right, yeah. uh, which, as you, you were saying before, is portrayed in the film, the, the, the kind of reactionary, um, pro-legitimist, uh, or pro-monarchy like, um, movement being uh, dispensed with a, a whiff of uh, a grape shot, um, you know, but at the same time, it wasn't just threats from the right. There were also threats from the left, right? The Jacobins were, were basically reviving um, over the period of kind of from 1795 through to 1799. They, they were kind of regathering themselves, in effect. Um, and, the, and the regime was basically ultimately never able to impose um, order. Like the, the, main, the whole main basis for why Robespierre had been toppled um, had never actually been you know, the, the main the main desire from the bourgeois never actually been accomplished, um, and very quickly the kind of you know the the bourgeois had, had already displayed that it had no real um, republican principles at its heart, anyways, right? And uh, it, it displayed that with its constant attempts to to reconcile with the king, um, and and uh, you know, or, or with or with uh, the monarchists after after Louis' execution, so. For them, I think they 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 began to see in in in, in Napoleon a, a potential solution in effect. Mm. Um, that you know here here was here was this this man with with the respect of the army that could could finally bring that long awaited for order. Um, but at the same time, I think they there was probably a degree of uh, uh, I think of of naivety from elements of the bourgeois that they thought they felt they could control this 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 little uh, guy from Corsica, right? Mm. Like he the, the little corporal. Exactly, exactly. You know that they could, you know, he could just do this the nasty business of of uh, putting all of this all of this republican nonsense to an end. And uh, and then eventually, you know, that the, the these kind of figures like Barras could uh, could really r- run the show, right? These kind of dignified statesmen of the of the, of the the kind of republican years. Uh, and so on, and I, I think they obviously didn't really anticipate that he would have a, a kind of will and uh, of his own, and an ambition of his own. How does Napoleon spring his coup? Mm. Well, yeah, it's portrayed in the film like this, like really farcical, uh, like moment, right? Of, of I think at one point he, he, he walks in and he gets like mobbed by the assemblyman and uh, has to convince the soldiers like you know you, you should get in there like they tried to kill me <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> um and uh you know i think yeah i think it was more well executed than that uh in effect i mean he he uh he, he leans upon uh the army right uh, we've been talking about this you know throughout like the the mm. fact that you know one of napoleon's bases with is with the army and he leans on that to to affect basically this this overturn of the the directory uh, in uh, it, it kind of in alliance with uh, with Barras, yeah, to kind of create a triumvirate, yeah, uh, and effectively now three consuls, exactly, exactly. There, I mean, this is an interesting thing about kind of the the, the nightmares of the, of the of the past wing, like a uh, an alp, yeah, yeah, <laughs> like a hobgoblin, <laughs> <laughs> exactly, like you know, because all th- like like all throughout they're kind of staging this whole historical process if it's the Roman Republic right mm. with all these terms and stuff and then you see the same in 1848 where they're staging the whole thing as if it's the French Revolution mm. um, but anyways yeah like that yeah that is is, is the base for it in effect they the, the, the directory is it, it's exhausted itself um, and he affects this this coup by just basically bringing the soldiers to the uh, t- to the assembly and uh, and and basically pre- presenting them with a with, with a, a fait accompli basically like you, you you know, this is the this is the power in society. Yeah. This is how it is, lads. <laughs> yeah, in effect, um, which is a, obviously a coup d'état, right? And um, and and overturns that and, and completely violates the, the 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 kind of the constitution of seventeen ninety five, I believe, which had which had been drafted to to replace the the, the much more radical Jacobin constitution. Mm. Mm. Um, and yeah, that that was the kind of beginning of of, of Napoleon's. Um, path to being becoming emperor because at this point even though there's three consuls it's very clear who's in charge yeah um because the others the other have no basis to lean upon yeah at, at this point like, it, it's the man with the troops and, and the guns that yes is, is is very clearly calling 
uh, the shots. But that's uh, we have to understand though, like it's not there's sometimes a misconception in there that like that's how that's where all power kind of comes from, right? Just mm. just very plain, like in that plain way, as if, as if basically any army commander could do what Napoleon mm. um, had done. When that is not the case, right? It was right. very particular set of historical circumstances that allowed him to play that role. And we'll come back to that, but mm. I want to talk a little bit, and I am going to deal with it briefly because yeah. this is the one bit the film does deal with it in, mm. in a bit more depth, mm. although it spends a bit more time on his frankly really awkward to watch relationship with josephine which we're not going to deal with Mm. because it's actually not terribly interesting Mm. it it deals with his wars Mm. it depicts six of them i think in the course Mm. of the film Mm -hmm. um something like that you have austerlitz you've got waterloo at the Mm. end um now napoleon's wars um against ultimately a a coalition of nations Mm. uh Changed the face of Europe. Mm. I mean, the film makes the point that something like three million people died mm. in Napoleon's mm. wars. It was a, a really major turning point in world history. It also fed the Industrial Revolution, mm. um, or the early Industrial Revolution, uh, because all the other countries of the world, you know, Britain had to churn out a huge amount of iron in order mm. to build mm. up its army. Um, how would you characterize Napoleon's impact on world mm. history as a military leader? Mm. I mean, yeah, as you say, like uh, having an enormous impact, and I think I would say an accidentally progressive one as well. I think, um, yeah, he was definitely. I think he waged, and then sometimes he justified his expansionism, and he dressed it up as I'm defending the, 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 the I'm defending the French Revolution, yeah, um, and and so on when he, when he had no um, no desire to do so whatsoever. Yeah. Well, I mean, there were illusions in Napoleon. I mean, Beethoven Absolutely. famously, who was uh, a staunch Republican, mm. very radical in his politics, really admired Napoleon mm. up mm. until the point that he declared himself emperor. Yeah, but before that, yeah, in his yeah. mind, he was exporting the Enlightenment. He was mm. exporting. Mm radical republican values mm. throughout uh, europe at the point of a sword mm. um mm. and and um he had his admiration for that reason mm. the eroica was written about him originally. yeah 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 no exactly and i and and I, in a certain sense because there's a kernel of truth to it mm. because even though he, it was not his into he wasn't um kind of courageously spreading the revolution um the the the, the, the reality was is that everywhere that his soldiers went and conquered they did completely overhaul uh the kind of the the social relations in those in those places right like um whether it was kind of the redistribution of property which had a really decisive effect over the rhineland right mm. um and created actually like he basically set in motion a process in uh in in, in that part of, of of europe of um of, of yeah like the, the 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 strengthening and growth of, of the of the german bourgeoisie in mm. effect mm. that would culminate with with the with the revolution of 1848 i think you can kind of trace trace the, a, a decisive acceleration of that to when Napoleon's armies are sweeping through, uh, and and basically dispossessing the, the the old the old landlords and aristocrats, mm. right, in the in the church the church lands and so on, um, like that's that's all re- like that's all taking place, right, despite the fact that politically he's he's affected the most brutal counter revolution, right. Yes. Um, and it's there's an al- analogy there, of course, with with Stalin and the Soviet Union again, right. Yeah. Um, the fact that when Soviet troops occupied territory in Eastern Europe, mm. um. Even even though like the, Stalin had affected a, a counter revolution and there was a sea of blood between him and and the Bolsheviks, right? Mm. Um, because he based himself on the property relations of the of the of, of what the revolution had created, right? In, in the case of Stalin, obviously the nationalized property um, that was also Im, Im, imposed upon the territories that were conquered, and that has a kind of progressive character too. Yes. Well, it's interesting. You know, even a deform worker state mm. is far more progressive than the imperialist mm. nations that surrounded it in the case of the USSR and in the case of the Napoleonic Wars even the degenerated shell of the mm. French Revolution and what remained of it mm. Mm. Um, we're not going to deal with I think the, the, the circumstances of Napoleon's eventual defeat and downfall mm. that is in the film um, more or less accurately <laughs> what I want to talk about really is the Marxist theory that's named after mm. Napoleon, Bonapartism, mm-hmm. which Marx develops in his writings on France. Mm. And um, I wonder if you could explain, um, albeit a little briefly, mm. um, what this actually means. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, it, it's it's rule of the sword, um, mm. whereby the state is able to you know, base itself above, uh, so stand above society, uh, more so than than than, than normal, mm. uh, and kind of act as a kind of arbiter between uh, the classes, always defending. 
the, the, the ruling class's property in the last analysis, right? Mm. Um, but it's ultimately able to, to determine things that you know, and do things that are against its, its, its will, in effect, right? Yes. Um, it, it imposes itself upon upon the bourgeois politically. Yeah, I think the way that Trotsky puts it is that uh, Bonapartism, it raises the ruling cl- class up by the throat. Mm. So it raises it up mm. um, to maintain its position of privilege, mm. but it does so while denying its political freedom. Exactly, exactly. Um, and it does, it, it, you know, it, it's something that emerges uh, in, in very particular circumstances, right? Um, it, it's, it can't, it's not something that, that it's just, it, you, you, we can't understand this as um, an outcome of the, the will of these of, of great men mm. um, to become, to play this dominant role in society. It emerges instead rather because of a class of real living social forces, right? Mm. Uh, and in a particular situation where you have the, the, the kind of mutual exhaustion of the kind of main contending classes. So in 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 Napoleon's situation between kind of um yeah the the the, the bourgeois uh the and the the aristocracy and and uh, the kind of the sans culottes masses right uh that an exo- a mutual exhaustion between those and um in other situations um yeah like we see the, the the emergence of the same thing in 1848 again with with the with the proletariat and the and, and the and the bourgeoisie a kind of mutual exhaustion where neither is able to impose um, their their like rule over society yeah. in effect, and a strong man comes to the fore exactly. in order to impose order by force exactly. using the state. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, at, to to the interest, to the ultimate interest of mm. of the ruling class. And Marx says that uh, Bonapartism, for him anyway, was the modern incarnation of Caesarism. Mm. He talks mm. about Caesar doing much the same thing mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, in the death agony of the Roman Republic. Mm. Mm. Exactly, exactly. And I wanted to pick up on a point that you made uh, in passing, this question mm. of the role of the individual in history, because mm. I think this is another thing that the film does a real disservice to, because Marxists actually don't deny mm. the role of individuals in history. You made the point that if a figure other than Napoleon had faced the legitimist counter-revolution, things mm. might have gone differently, mm. because maybe someone else wouldn't have pulled the trigger. <laughs> but the point is, Napoleon was only able to be Napoleon mm. because the forces of history had coalesced in such a way to make someone like him mm. possible, mm. right? Um, the same is true on the positive side of, of Robespierre or mm. Lenin. You know, uh, How many people in history had Lenin's personal characteristics? Probably very many, but how many of them were in the right place at the right time mm-hmm. to play Lenin's role? Mm. Only Lenin. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's the same um, with, with Napoleon Bonaparte. And the way that the, the film portrays him is more or less this deeply insecure and troubled and mm. angry little brute mm. who mm. does everything that he does because he's sad that his wife Josephine is sleeping around mm. <laughs> as far as I can tell and because his mother tells him to mm. Mm. Um, you know he, he's I mean the, the agenda of the film is, is clearly to portray that the emperor has no clothes mm. right mm. but it implies that everything that happens it's, it, I think you were saying before we started recording mm. it's like the great man theory of history in, in reverse mm. it's the, the small man <laughs> view of history where um, this this guy's insecurities and anger and self loathing compelled him to mm, conquer half mm. of the world, yeah, yeah. rather than him being an agent of historical forces that were greater uh, and broader than he was. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's and 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 there's obviously a kind of dialectical relationship between those two things, right? Between the the, the kind of the the, the the characteristics of a particular individual and the historical forces at at play, like as and as, that's kind of what you were saying, right? Like someone someone less less of a kind of uh, um, a military genius in effect, right? Like you yeah. have to have to. Oh, he was. I mean, you know, Napoleon's reforms to warfare mm. tr- changed the entire game. I mean, yeah, uh, the yeah. use of cores, these combined mm. arms formations that could operate more or less independently, mm, mm. that set the standard for warfare ever since. It mm. still does to this yeah, day. Yeah, yeah. And actually, in the end, it had to be used against him by mm. the coalition of nations to bring him down. Yeah. No. Exactly. Exactly. So yeah. you you know that that is that is is, is important in in facilitating why it was him and not some other um, military figure, right? Because I I don't think he was the only figure in the army with ambition. Mm. Um, but at the same but at the same time, you know. Is is that period of history the only time where military men had ambition? No, clearly not, right? Clearly, I'm sure there's 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 plenty of would be uh, would be Bonapartists throughout history. In fact, we know that's the case in Britain. We know that's the case with Lord Mountbatten, right? Mm. Um, who would have loved to have played the role of a Napoleon of his of his day, um, and and was was actually kind of he was consulted as, as to whether he he might he might play such a role. Uh, in the face of, um, you know, I think it was Harold Wilson's Labour government and and some of the reforms, mild reforms it was it was it was making, um, 
you know there was there was there was chatter about him him kind of launching a coup in the end the the project was abandoned because i think they realized that the the, the balance of forces was wildly against them uh, for such an endeavor right and that harold wilson was no threat to bourgeois property which is absolutely correct um but nevertheless right like there's that's a, that's there's something important there was it just that lord Mountbatten was i mean okay yeah sure he, he, maybe he wasn't as, as as much of a military genius as, as napoleon i don't think that's up for debate necessarily but the real the real main reason why Mountbatten never became a napoleon is because the, the the social forces weren't there for it right you didn't have mm. this this you know, society in, in, in a complete state of disorder as a result of like a, a frantic years of class struggle mm-hmm. in which uh, there's this burning desire on the part of, of the ruling class to bring things to it to, to an end, right? And and, and restore that order. You didn't have that situation didn't open up. So there was no need for it. There's no historical need for 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 Mountbatten to play that role. Even though clearly he would have loved to, right? Yeah. Uh, there's one last thing I want to speak about before we call it a day, because I'm sure some people are listening to this and thinking, Oh, you grumpy communists um, it's only a film. Why are you complaining that it's not perfectly historically accurate? I mean, there's plenty of other artistic criticisms we could make about the god awful script and the awkward <laughs> pacing and the excessive length and so on. Mm. But it's true. Um, it's not fair to expect a film to be a historical document. We're mm. not expecting that. But I do think that the film and also Ridley Scott's comments about it mm. in response to these criticisms of historical inaccuracy, they speak to a reactionary attitude Mm. about history and about historical truth. Mm -hmm. I've actually pulled up this quote (laughs) from Ridley Scott, Mm. where in response to a British historian, Dan Snow, who made some not unjust criticisms Mm. of the historical limitations of the film, he also complimented it artistically. He Mm. said he thought it was a good film, but just it got some of the facts wrong. Ridley Scott said, get a life. Uh, Furthermore said... Excuse me, mate, were you there? No, <laughs> well, shut the F up then. Mm. Um, and goes on to say further, like all history, it's been reported. Napoleon dies, then 10 years later, someone writes a book. Then someone takes the book and writes another. And so 400 years later, there's a lot of imagination in history books. And I think this goes to show a really postmodern contempt mm. for mm. historical truth. It reminds me of someone like Henry Ford saying history is just one damn thing after another. Mm. It's not just saying, look, I took some artistic license for Mm. the sake of Mm. drama, which is fair enough. That's absolutely fine. He's saying, I don't care about what's true. Mm. I don't Mm. care if this is true or not. Mm. It doesn't matter. Mm. And using that license, he he sneaks in um, an agenda and sneaks in messages, which Mm. which, which completely distort the role that Napoleon played and also... Mm. Um, the the nature of the political events depicted in the film. And also, I think there's a bit of an attempt to slide some identity politics in there, Mm. depicting Josephine as this strong, put-upon woman. (laughs) I mean, really, she was just a grubby aristocrat like all the rest. She was just trying to reclaim some of what she'd lost in the French Revolution. Um, It's true, actually, that she didn't like Napoleon very much. That Mm. does come across in their letters, Mm. but that's Mm. another story. Um, Yeah, just to round us out, can Mm. we talk about this question of historical truth and Mm. why it matters, Mm -hmm. um, why why we care Mm. about the way that historical events are depicted? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think you're absolutely right to characterise it as a kind of a postmodern contempt for history. Um, And this idea that, like, yeah, I mean, the, the whole film feels like one damn thing after another mm. um and i you know you just sort of it just yeah event with no sort sort of overarch no no real explanation other than just like he's insecure about his marriage so he's, he's just he's gonna he's gonna have to conquer the world basically yeah to make up for that um and that is yeah the, like that is that is a problem uh and i, I you know I feel, I feel like the the napoleon firing his cannons against um against the the pyramids was almost like Ridley Scott like putting his fingers up to history in a way mm. um because it, it yeah it, like there is there is there is an importance to it because we study events like this um to to be able to to understand the kind of phenomena that we're confronted with to understand these things understand bonapartism and so on which is not a historic okay it's, it's named after a guy that's that's gone but that's not just a purely historical phenomena that's a phenomena mm. we we encounter today right yeah um there are bonapartist regimes all around the the world and so on and we have to understand how they c- come into being how do we how do we do that other than through like a careful analysis of history like that is the marxist method um and there's just such, like i think just to to encourage that contempt for history, um, you know, it does. It would do. You know, if we were to adopt such a thing, it would do us an enormous disservice, right? Um, and I think, you know, 
uh, yeah, I think like that kind of postmodern idea that um, well, because his- history is just all bunk anyways, right? It's just narrative basically, and and so if it's all just narrative, here's mine. Yeah, um, that was kind of the the, the kind of a t- the tape with it, but that's not the the reality of it of yes. the situation. Doing and of course, if you think there's no lawfulness, the the main thing that le- leads you to is, is a kind of status quo effect mm. right because you can't change anything it's because nihilism exactly it's, it is it's is exactly that i think it's sort of like well you can't really understand anything so you certainly can't change it um and and that that is a very cynical thing and of course that cynicism i think is really clear in, in this film because the, it starts with that the the this, that kind of scream where it says france 1789 uh, the masses are driven to to revolution by despair but the revolution brings even more misery yeah it wasn't a good start <laughs> no, I, I literally within two seconds of the film beginning i realized i wasn't going to enjoy myself yeah yeah exactly but that that kind of cynicism permeates it i think as well um and, and yeah it's not an accident that therefore someone that is, is a cynical about that is also you know cynical about history itself i think these things aren't disconnected at all Right. Well, thanks a lot, Keelan. I think that this has been infinitely more entertaining and enlightening than the film and about uh, 30% of the length. (laughs) So I hope that everybody got something out of the discussion. I certainly did. I'll put a link to Keelan's review of the film in the description for this episode so you can give it a read. Um, I recommend all of Marx's writings on France that deal with the phenomenon of Bonapartism and the rise of Napoleon's nephew, uh, Napoleon III, to power. Uh, in the 1850s so last time Keelan thank you so much for joining us thank you and I will see you all next week <laughs>